Worshipping, I saw this large cornfield and I saw the angels of the Lord encamped around this cornfield, this huge, massive field. And the Lord was just basically reiterating my spirit that the harvest is plentiful. Yeah. Yeah. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. What I'm seeing is angels encamped around, and I mean the angels are like watching over this harvest field, but they're all just standing waiting, and they're waiting for the harvesters. And, and I see that in my heart inside of me go, Lord, here we are, send us. Yes. Here we are, send us, Lord. Yes, Lord. You know what intrigues me about that scripture? You have studied that yourself. Where, it, where, where God speaks about that the, 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 the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And he says, uh, therefore pray that the Lord may, and here's it in the Greek, it says, thrust forth. It's a, it's a very aggressive action in the Greek. Thrust forth laborers, but here's the key, now listen to this, into his harvest. Now what's the key there this morning for us? Listen, this is the way the Lord, Lord is going this morning. We just flow with it. Holy Spirit, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, Lord. Here's the thing, and I want you to catch this. Besides the ministry of the Word this morning, the worship, you being in the presence of God, catch this. God calls your unsaved relatives His harvest. Come on now. Yes. God calls your unsaved friends His harvest. Yes. God calls your unsaved acquaintances and colleagues his harvest. He says, therefore, pray for the Lord to send forth, thrust forth the laborers into his harvest. Father, this morning we thank you for that. The harvest that is ready. Amen. Father, people are seeking and crying and yearning for a relationship with Jesus. They are learn, looking for a Savior like Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you will manifest yourself unto the unsaved ones. Lord, your word says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. Bless the light of the glorious gospel of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Therefore, we thank you this morning that the veils are removed yes. from those who need to yes. come. Father, as the harvest, this last day, end day harvest, that's going to be swept into the kingdom of God. Yes, amen. Father, our hearts this morning as a fellowship cry out for souls, souls for the kingdom of God. That souls will not go to perdition, but they will be saved, that they will be sanctified, that they will be brought into the kingdom of God. Yes. There's no greater joy in the kingdom of God than a lost sinner coming home. Amen. And we thank you this morning for that, Father. And Lord, we pray that where we go and where we are, that we will be lights. I even had, saw at one time in that vision, I saw these spotlights on the cornfields. It's like the Lord is saying, the lights are on even at night because I'm waiting for the harvesters. So Father, thank you. Wherever we go, we're not going to be shy or embarrassed. Paul the Apostle said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to all of yes. You see, the preaching of the cross, the simplicity of the cross is foolishness to the world, but it is wisdom to those who come to Christ. Amen. Thank you for that this morning, Father. Can I ask you just for a moment to mention the name of someone you would love to see in the kingdom of God? Just for a moment. Doesn't have to be somebody you like, somebody you love, somebody you're fond of. But the Lord, as I said it, the Holy Spirit brought somebody onto your spirit. Right there and then He brought somebody, brought a name or a face. Father, the persons that they have right now in this spirit that you brought to them. We pray in Jesus' name right now for those persons, Father. That they will come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, that they will rise up, Lord, from the, the place of despair and come to a place of hope. That they will uh, rise up from the place of being lost and they will come into the living Savior. And as we've mentioned their names before you, we thank you now that Jesus comes. And with His power and by His Spirit, by any means, will start ministering into the hearts and lives of those people so that they will come to the cross in Jesus' name. And we all say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Like I said, I was rearing to go this morning, charged up again, boosters are fueled up, 
But, uh, you know, we've asked Serena to come and minister the word to us this morning and for us this morning. Uh, when we had our, um, our time out with the Lord out in the bush, with our, um, our jump start, he ministered there as well, and the Spirit just started working through him. Man, I tell you what, there were people who were so touched by the Lord at the Jump Start weekend, that particular Saturday weekend, it's going to be a weekend soon, but on that Saturday, that as he started ministering even, there were tears coming down the cheeks of people because of the way that the Spirit of God moved there on that particular Saturday. And we thank God for that. Amen. Amen. We thank the Lord. There's a lot more to come. But right now, we're going to ask you to come without further ado to come and minister. I, I love it when the young men rise up in the ministry, and we need to give them their rightful place. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Hello, Reno. Who loves the gifts of the Spirit? I love the gifts of the Spirit. But who knows the gifts of the, of the Spirit are without repentance? The gifts don't determine your spiritual maturity. The gifts don't determine your intimacy with God. In fact, the gifts is the grace of God for those around you. The gifts aren't there for you. The gifts are there for those around you. You can have a horrible day. You can be in the worst state and still operate in the gift. Yeah. Yeah. I promise you, if Joshua is having a bad day, he can still sing and give us goosebumps on goosebumps. <laughs> so the gifts of God are without repentance. Yes. You know, um, so I got saved about five, five years ago in a prophetic ministry, and after about 30 minutes I was prophesying. After 30 minutes, and we see it time and time again. It doesn't take a mature Christian to, to operate in the gifts. Um, so I actually want to share, want to share a vision, but before I do, I just want to share some, some, some short testimony or a short story actually. Um, so we used to have this, this, this story that we used to encourage people with, you know, to, to start operating in the gifts, you know, because the hardest part is opening up your mouth. It's like praying in tongues, you know, the hardest the Holy Spirit is not going to take your mouth and move it for you. The hardest part is, is actually opening up your mouth. Same with prophecy. In fact, it's on the exact same frequency. You know, when you when you speak in tongues, you don't know what the next word's going to be. It, it just it just goes. Same with prophecy. You know, like I can, for example, I can stop my my tongues with the letter K, with the letter B, You know, same with prophecy. You can. It, it, it's where you flow with the God. Where you flow with the Holy Spirit. You flow with God, and it's it's, it's, it's an absolute communion. You know. Um, so, absolutely, the hardest part is opening up your mouth and lying into the through you. So there's one story we, we used to tell on the first day of each and every session is um, this one big, big prophet, his, his name is Wally, you know, so I'm, I'm always very sensitive to call people prophets. He doesn't call himself a prophet, but usually the people that call themselves prophets are those that you need to be wary of. Uh, anyway, yes. very, very humble man, but this guy, you know, he, he speaks the word of God, you know. And um, he used to share his butterfly story. So there's one time he prophesied over this, over this young girl. And man, he was, he was hitting the note. It was a comprehensive word, clear, concrete, giving direction. And this girl just said, thank you, I receive it. And the next person that gave the word was, was this very new Christian that said, all I see is just a butterfly. And this girl burst out in tears, crying, I love butterflies, you know? So it's important to share with you what you, what you feel in your heart. And on Friday night, I actually had my own butterfly experience. We were, we were um, invited to go to a youth ministry. And we had like a little, little session where we were just you know, sharing, sharing a, a, a short word. And um, so we just need to go So I was I was giving a word to this young man, you know. And I think it was a fairly fairly okay word, you know, the Holy Spirit's word. Okay. So as I was saying, yeah, so I gave a word on Friday night to this young kid, and you know, fairly, fairly decent word I, I think, you know, the Holy Spirit mood wasn't wasn't of myself. And the next moment this this little girl said, Let you have Jesus is leafier. And I thought to and this guy just burst into tears. This girl wasn't wasn't older than 15, sharing just something that, that the Lord laid on her heart. So my story, or the, like the reason I started with this, I want to share a vision that God gave me yesterday. I was, I was so excited about this. Um, I saw I saw a vision of this beautiful eagle 
fly. It was the most beautiful eagle I'd, I'd ever seen. It had the colors of the rainbow in, it, in its feathers. And I saw this bright, bright light. The sun was, was so bright. But my attention was on the eagle flying. And many times this eagle represented us. And the more I focused on the beauty of the eagle, the bigger its shadow became on the ground. And the more I focused on the light, the smaller the shadow became. And I said, Lord, what does this mean? And then it hit me. And I jumped out of my room. I went to the anchor and I said, Liffy, God just gave me the most awesome word. And God said this to me. When we focus on ourselves, we cause shadows. A shadow is an object that abstracts light. He is light. In him is no darkness at all. And when we focus on ourselves, when we are so focused on our ability, how we can perform, what we can do, our gifts, our abilities, we cause a shadow where he just wants to flow through you. But when, and, and, and as, I, as I started focusing, it's like he, he took my focus from the eagle onto the shadow that was created. When you focus on yourself, when you focus on your ability, you create a shadow. And then he, he took my focus onto this light, which was so bright, you know, like you, it was like you, you couldn't stare into it. And it was like this eagle started to become, you know, almost like invisible. And then it, it, it was like a magnifying glass. And the light just got magnified through this eagle. So this morning I want to talk about dying to self. Um, it is when you die to self that he can move through you. It is where you move out of the way, when you move out of the way, that he moves through you. Um, to come back to my, to my, like my season in the prophetic, um, at one stage in my walk there, I got very comfortable. In fact, I got arrogant about the gifts. You know, we used to prophesy for six, seven hours straight. People would come in and just, just prophesy, just prophesy. And it wasn't, it's not difficult. It's just you allow the Spirit to move through you. It wasn't my ability. Even in my arrogance, I still loved the people. Even, even in pride coming up in me, you know, like I, I used to feel of people saying, you know, that was so good. Wow, spot on, exactly what I needed to hear. I used to feed off people's reaction and their feedback. And um, you know, we used to prophesy and, and speak into people's lives you know, for hours and hours, half an hour at a time per person, you know, like God just moved powerfully. And, um, you, you know, look, the, the focus isn't on, on, on the person being used, the focus is on Him moving through you, and He will still move through you, even though you miss it. And at one stage, you know, so, I can give an uncle, you know, my tongue quite handbrake to sometimes without my consent. Sometimes in conversations, my tongue just, just decides, put you to any further, you know. You know, it, it's been awkward for me because, you know, you, you, you face people and they don't know, should I finish your sentence or should I just look away, what should I do? That's the, for me, that's the worst part. People don't know how to react. And sometimes it, it, it's, it's bad for me. You know, sometimes I can't finish my sentence, but usually when I, when I, when I minister, the anointing just, just, just goes over and my speech is usually fluent. So there's one specific time we, we were going to minister to a few, a few first year students and I was, I was so, so really foolish, you know, because God just speaks, you know, you just give him an opportunity and he will flow. And I could not speak, I stuttered so badly, like the, the, the pictures came clearly, the impressions that I got in my spirit were, were concrete and fluent, and if I had to write it out, it would be a powerful word, but I could not speak. I couldn't speak, like I just, it was so difficult, like I stuttered extremely badly, I stuttered, it was, it was all, all me, all self, all self, absolutely gifts, no relationship. And I actually excused myself, went outside, and I said, Lord, what's going on? Like, Lord, what's going on? And God said, without me, you can do nothing. <laughs> and that really changed my whole life. It was about four years ago when that happened. And every time I get the opportunity to minister, when I get up, I fall on my knees and I say, Lord, thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the honor to have been in communion with you, to have fellowship with you, to have been used by you. Um, I'm going to ask Manny, will you please start that? Presentation. Um, before you put it on, I just want to read a quick scripture. Those of you who have your Bibles, Galatians 2:20. So obviously this morning I'm, I'm talking about dying to self, you know, and I think I think when we sell the gospel to unsaved people, I think a lot of times we don't really sell the full picture. You know, it's about all the benefits that you're going to get, you're going to be blessed with, you know, all these things. But I think oftentimes we we don't paint the concrete picture. And it says in Galatians 2.20. Just a second. Okay. 
Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And he would play a presentation. So God gave me a few pointers around dying to self, and it, it, it blew my mind. Um, is it on the board? I'm just going to move out of the way quickly. So this is the Passion Translation. Look how, look how awesome this, this says, Luke 9, 23. And Jesus said, if you truly desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely. Embrace my cross as your own and surrender to my ways. Now this is the gospel. This is the gospel. It's all about transformation. And transformation takes place when you deny yourself. When the focus isn't on the eagle, but on the light, on the sun. Um, would you go to the next slide okay, for me, please? So, the first point, or the, the starting point, the starting point of, um, of dying to self is where you confess. You know, it's impossible to die to self if you're living in denial. When you've got, when you've got stuff that you're, that you're facing with, you're not being completely honest about it. You're never going to die to self. And dying to self is not a bad thing. I'm, I'm going to show you a bit later on. Dying to self is actually where you commune with God. Dying to self is actually where you live out your identity, where you drink from Him, where you, where you embrace Him, and, and are so intimate and close with Him. Dying to self isn't all that bad. Well, carnally it seems bad. Carnally it seems like you are literally committing a slow suicide over your life, and you are dying to self. So, confession is where you pour out your heart to Him. You, you express exactly how you feel. Um, I think this, is, this actually blew my mind last night when God showed me that Jesus had to deny his flesh in the garden when he said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. In the garden, Jesus poured out his heart. He, he sweat blood. That's how, that's how enormous the pressure and the stress and the anxiety was yeah. in that moment for him. Yes. But he, he confessed his true heart. You know, so, when we die to ourselves, the first step is being honest. The first step is saying, Lord, this is so big, this is so tough. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to the bone. I'm so full of stress. I'm so nervous. And that's the first part. Maybe thank you. The second part is communion. You know, Your confession will, will, will automatically drive you into communion. I think this is so powerful. Communion with God isn't always romantic or a state of worship. Job, in all his despair and tribulation, a communion with God. Have you thought about that? Job, in all those chapters, even though it was, you know, half of the time murmuring and complaining, he still had communion with God. Yes. And a lot of times, that, that despair or that state will lead you into the place of communion and intimacy where you want to be. But it all starts with that confession. It starts with that initial acknowledging that state where you need to die to self. Um, I think this is also pretty, pretty awesome. Sometimes deep communion starts at despair. We need to wrestle with God like Jacob did before we, before we receive our breakthroughs. Thank you, Mary. So the third step is surrender. You know, when you, when you start having, having communion, when you, after you've confessed and after you've, you've you know, communed with, with the Father, that drives you to a state of surrender. It automatically does. And Jesus said, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but yours. And in your, in your struggle, in the battle that you're facing, you also get to that point, you know, your communion may, may start, or your, your surrender may start at a point of despair, and you struggle, and you fight, and you complain, and maybe you're in tears, but that builds up. As soon as you start taking those thoughts captive and saying, Lord, Father, this is difficult, Lord, but you remain good. My, my circumstances don't determine who I am, Father, but you say who I am, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you're good. Automatically, it starts building up, it starts building up. Faith arises in you. Faith arises when you get to a point where you say, Lord, your way, not mine. And surrender means that you release control. So it's no longer your battle, but it's his, it's, his, it's his battle. You surrender the outcome, and you surrender the process to God. So Lord, whatever, whatever needs to take place, even if it doesn't work out according to what I want, Lord, even if what I ask for doesn't, doesn't happen, Father, you are still in control, you are still good, you are still God, Father. You cannot deny yourself, you remain awesome, you remain good, Father, you are a loving, kind Father, Lord. And I am in a state of surrender, Father. So you take control, or you take control. As I mentioned earlier, dying to self is actually the best thing you can do. Because that is where you reach that, that point of intimacy. When you have, when you have passed those, those three points, you start drawing from the substance. I am the bread of life, he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. 
But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. When you, that, when, you, when you come to that point where you've surrendered to God, it's all spirit from there. You say, Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, that you're good. Thank you that I rest in your peace, Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your streams of living water going through me. And the Spirit of God takes over your whole being, your whole situation, and you reach a point where you are dying to self, where He where you actually draw from the substance, where you're so close and so intimate, even in the worst of circumstances, you reach that point. The first point is you, you reach a point of rest. You know, after, you've, after you've been with the Holy Spirit, after you've been with Him, you just have that peace. You just have that, that complete surrendered peace where He takes control. Come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works. Do you know the dying to self, you know, we, we, as Christians we confess to live by grace, but we take things in our own strength. Yeah. Grace is not just what you believe, it's what you do. Mm-hmm. Grace is seizing, seizing from your works and entering into God works. Yeah. As the next point, I said, I said the dying to self means dying to self works and entering God works. Where you literally live out grace. Where it's only God, only what He did, nothing of yourself, it's all Him. And that's where the ego starts becoming beautiful. It doesn't mean that the ego doesn't have to be beautiful, it just means that your focus isn't on your beauty, your focus is on God. Amen. 